that there's always this gap in our life. And it's a gap between our expectation and our reality. Like we have this expectation of the way that something should be. And then when the reality of that expectation is, is, is not the same, it creates this gap, right? You had an expectation that your job was going to go a certain way, and here you are working that job, and it did. You have an expectation that your relationship is going to be a certain way, and, and here you are, and you're looking at this relationship, and it's not. Like you had this idea of the way it was going to turn out for some reason. It just didn't turn out that way, and so, and so you're, you're left in this gap, and in that gap, there is this tension, and that's where anxiety resides, and that's where our doubt resides, and that's where our fear resides, and some of us were camped right there between our expectation and our reality, and we have no idea what to do in that gap. We're struggling. And for some of us, if we're honest, it takes it up a step because our expectation is maybe something we want to see God do. Maybe it's a prayer that we've been praying. And you've been praying for a miracle, and you've been praying for God to heal, and you've been praying for God to restore. You've been praying for this financial miracle. Like there's something in your life you've been praying for, and you've been holding on for, and you believe God can do it, and you believe He'll do it, and you're holding on, you're holding on, and you're trying to have faith. And you're trying not to doubt, you're trying to believe, and you're trying to do it the right way, but there's that expectation, but the reality doesn't look anything like the prayer that you've been praying. And so what do you do when you're in the middle of that gap between the prayer that you've been praying and God answering in the way that you think He should answer, right? In that gap, there's the same fear, and there's doubt, and there's anxiety, and there's stress, and we just don't know what to do with that. I want you to understand that God has a purpose and God has a promise for your life. Every one of you. He created you with a purpose and, and He's given you a promise. And, and some of us, we're in between that declaration and that actual receiving of that promise in our life. And we just don't know what to do. So for you, what is it? Is it your marriage? Is it your career? Is it your finances? Is it, is, it, is it your health? Maybe there's something in your life that you once pursued with such excitement and such passion and such purpose, but right now you just don't even really care about it that much. You just kind of threw up your hands and said, well, my reality isn't meeting my expectation, so what's the point? My, my reality looks nothing like I thought it would, so, so this is just the way it's going to be. Why do I keep trying? Because nothing that I do ever quite seems good enough. No matter what I do, I can't move from my expectation to receiving the reality of it. And we don't know what to do. And Hebrews chapter 10 verse 36 says this. Patient endurance is what you need now. I, I don't know what you think you need, but here's God's word says, here's what you need. You need patient endurance is what you need now so that you will continue to do God's will. So you don't throw your hands up. You don't get frustrated. You don't give up. You don't quit. You don't jump out. No, 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 no. You continue to do God's will. And when you do that, you will receive all that he has promised for you. That's what his word says. When you wait with patient endurance, you keep doing what you know to do, you keep doing the right things, you keep doing God's will, you keep applying His Word to your life, whatever His Word says, you just do it, whatever His Word says, you just believe it, you hold on to it, you trust it, then you will receive not some of it, not a portion of it, but you will receive everything that He has promised to you. But you will never possess it if you don't have some perseverance in your life. And today I want to give you three ways that we, or reasons, that we stop short of God's promises. We're in between the expectation and the reality. And somewhere in the middle here, there's usually about three reasons that we stop short. We'll try to get through them all today. But here's the one I really want you to get. Is, 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 is our perspective gets blocked. Our perspective gets blocked. We're in this series called Jericho, and it's about the life of Joshua. And, and Joshua is this mighty warrior, and, 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 and we probably, even if you haven't heard, had much experience in church, you know a little bit about Moses. 
Uh, God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. The children of Israel were in bondage, and so God used Moses as a redeemer for his generation to lead the children of Israel out of, out, out of bondage into the promised land. You've probably been a little bit familiar with that, but they're not quite to the promised land yet where we are in this series. Moses has died, and now his assistant Joshua has stepped up to take a place of leadership. And so here Joshua is leading the Israelites, and they come to a place called Jericho. And it's this city that has these fortified walls, and Joshua chapter 6 verse 1 says this, Now the gates of Jericho were tightly shut, just like some of your promises, some of your expectations, some of the promises God has spoken to you has been tightly shut, because the people were afraid of the Israelites. Nobody was allowed in or out. The Lord said to Joshua, and I want you to see this. He didn't say, I'm going to give this to you. He didn't say, this promise will be yours. He says, Joshua, I have given you Jericho. I've given you its king. I've given you its strong warriors. You and your fighting men, all you have to do, all you have to do is follow my instructions. I've already given it to you. It's already yours. Your name is already on it. It is It is. The ownership is yours. You just don't have possession of it yet. Joshua had an expectation. God had spoken to him about a promise, but it's not his reality yet. So what does he do in the middle? What does he do in the gap? Here's what he said. Here's what I want you to do. You and your fighting men, your army, should march around the town once a day for six days. All right? You math people, how many many times around the wall is that? Once a time for six days. Six. Are you guys here? I know it's a holiday weekend, but come on now. Give me something. All right? So one time a day for six days. You do the math. It is six. Thank you. So they're to march around the walls once a day for six days. That's six times. Seven priests will walk ahead of the ark, each carrying a ram's horn. So they are now the marching band. They got their trumpets, right? We got our trumpets. And on the seventh day, the last day. So I already have six days. Just one time a day. That's Six on the seventh day, you're to march around the town, the, the town seven times with the priest blowing the horn. So six plus seven is thirteen times. And when you hear the priest give this one long blast of the ram's horns, have all the people shout as loud as they possibly can. And then, when you do that, you follow the instructions. The walls of the town will collapse and the people can charge straight into town. But here's what I want you to see. Like, this was the first battle that they had to go through to possess the promise of God. And the first battle is always the hardest. That's always the toughest. The first time you do anything is the toughest part. And so here's Joshua leading his men in the first battle, right? And, 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 and here they are. And, and it wasn't that Jericho was such a big city. I mean, we're not talking about this expanse city. It's a, it's a fairly small place. The problem was the walls of the city were just so tall. It was intimidating. And see, for some of us, our Jericho, our problem, our circumstance, whatever it is that we need to conquer, right? Whatever that thing is, it's not that it's too big. That problem that you're facing can't be bigger than you because you have God on the inside of you, right? And if God is on the inside of you, there is no problem that you will ever face that will be bigger than what God is on the inside of you. Right? Greater is He that is in me, right? Greater is He that is in you than anything else in the world. So that problem that you're facing, that unanswered prayer, that un, un, unanswered expectation, none of that is bigger than God's power that's on the inside of you. But the problem is our perspective gets blocked. And we get so consumed by the walls and we get so consumed by the problems that that all of a sudden our our perspective is completely wrong and all of a sudden we begin to doubt what it is that we believe that God can do and maybe God can do that through them and maybe God can answer your prayer that way maybe God will even heal you but I don't know if he can do that for me because the walls around my city of Jericho just seem to be so big but that's why I love worship and that's why I've invited this band to stay on the stage for us
because here's what worship does for us it elevates us and it lifts us up and it changes our perspective so we don't just see the problems that we're facing but we see that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world and so this morning maybe you came in with your head down and maybe you came down with no confidence and, and all you can do is think about the problems. All you can think about is what you're facing in your family. All you can think about is the diagnosis. All you can think about is what you're going to face this week. But when you walk into this room, when the, when the band kicks in, when the cymbals start playing, when, 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 when the strings start strumming, all of a sudden the spirit of worship that fills this room, he inhabits the praises of his people. His spirit is here. And all of a sudden he lifts us up. So we're not just looking at a wall, but we're looking at a God who can solve every problem that we face in our life. So this morning I want us to sing that song again. But I want us to think about it in a completely different way. I want this to not just be songs that you sing, but let it be worship that you lift to the King and let Him change your perspective. See Him. See Him at work in your life. Even when it's not happening the way that you thought that it should, see Him. Don't focus on the problem. Focus on your King. Would you stand? And can we put some Word of God into action? Can we pray? Can we worship? Can we, can we? So why is worship so important? It raises our perspective and it gives us a different view. There's also something powerful about worshiping with people together. That's why coming together on a Sunday morning is so important. It's why coming together on, on Wednesday night, like this coming Wednesday night, we're going to have first Wednesday, this Wednesday night, where we just fill the room with worship and, and prayer and, and, and praise. I, I can worship by myself. I, I can pray by myself. Some of the greatest worship experiences and prayer experiences I've ever had were when I was alone. But there's something powerful about coming in this room and, and being surrounded by people and, and, and worshiping and calling on the name of Jesus. There's something powerful about that. There are moments in my life, maybe you're not like me, there's moments in my life where I, I just, I need the people around me. I need people to speak life into me when I don't feel like I can breathe. I like watching a football game at home by myself, sitting on my couch watching a TV, but it doesn't compare to the environment when you're surrounded by thousands of people who are doing the same, right? We were just hanging out, just having a great time together, cheering on our team. And even when I get frustrated, there are people around me that kind of cheer me on, right? We're just cheering, we're doing this thing together. Even as a state fan, you need that. <laughs> Especially as a state fan, it's necessary, you know? And, 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 and so it's, it's so important. I, I have a friend in my life that I, I called one day and I was just complaining. I'll be honest, I was complaining. And, and what's funny is I was literally complaining about something I'd asked him to pray with me about. I had literally said, I'd like for you to pray that this would happen, like this, 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 this was the expectation, I'm praying for it. But then what happened was the way God did it and the way that it happened was different than I thought. So what happened? It created anxiety, it created some doubt, it created some fear. And, and so God answered the prayer just a little bit differently than the way I thought. So I called my friend. I was like, man, you're not even going to believe what's happening. So I just, I'm, just, I was, I'm just complaining, man. I'm murmuring. Anybody else know how to murmur? You know? and, I, and, and, and my buddy, I think I called him at a bad time. Right? He wasn't as compassionate as he normally would have been. This wasn't Craig. And, and so, um, but I, I, I called, and, and the guy, he said, uh, he, he, this is what he said. He said, hey, Anthony, stop what you're doing right now. He said, I want you to look up. What do you see? I said, I see a tree. And he said, it's not a tree. It's manna. Look down. What do you see? I, 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 I said, it's, I, see, I see concrete. I'm walking downtown. Right. He said, no, it's not concrete. It's manna. And I guarantee you, Moses, if you would take that, 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 that spear in your hand or that staff in your hand and hit that rock, I guarantee you water would even gush out of it. Now rise up and be who God called you to be and stop walking around grumbling and complaining like Israelites. I called the wrong friend. Like, that's not what I wanted to hear. And, and maybe those references don't mean anything to you. But when the Israelites were just kind of wandering in the wilderness, God was feeding them with manna from the sky every day. They would wake up and, and, and there would literally be breakfast on the ground. And even this divine, miraculous encounter of God, they complained about it because they got sick of manna. 
So my friend was saying, hey, stop grumbling and stop complaining and start thanking God for what it is that he is doing in your life. What am I saying? I'm saying sometimes when your perspective gets blocked, you need somebody who loves you enough to mind your own business. We say that a lot around here. We, 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 we don't want somebody to just say, mind your own business. I want somebody who loves me enough who's not afraid to get in my business. I say all the time, if you love Jesus and you love me, and you, you love my family, you love our church, you can say anything in the world. You have an open door into my life. Why? Because we're living life together, loving our neighbor as ourselves. And sometimes we need people to speak life into us when we don't feel like we can breathe. And there are people in our life, there are people in this church family, if you'll give them an opportunity, they will give you a boost over the wall so you can have a different perspective when you, when you need it. So one reason we stop short is because our perspective gets blocked. But, but another reason is because our progress isn't always obvious. Now I'll kind of summarize this next part as I read through it. But Joshua calls the priests together. He tells them to take the, 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 the covenant and, and, and assigns them to walk in front of it, carrying those horns just like God told them to. March around the walls. The armed men are going to be in the front. And after Joshua spoke to the people, he, he basically tells them, I want you to follow directions, but don't say a word. I think that's fun. See, God told Joshua what was going to happen. Joshua never told the people what was going to happen. I don't know why he chose to lead that way, but literally, God says, this is how many times you're going to walk, and when you get done, the walls are going to fall and you're going to take the city. He never told the Israelites that. In fact, he told them, you just do what I tell you to, keep your mouth shut, and just keep marching. And at a point when I tell you to scream, you lift your voice and you shout with everything that you have within you. And so for them, their progress wasn't obvious it was, obvious to, it was obvious to Joshua, but it wasn't obvious to them. And I don't know about you, but I like progress. I'm that guy that puts things on the to-do list just so I can mark it off. Anybody say amen? You know what I'm talking about. Like we need some progress, right? I need progress. I, I, that's why I absolutely love to cut grass. I love it. I love it, and I couldn't figure out why. Maybe it's because I like being outside. I, maybe, maybe I like doing things with my hands. I don't know. I love to cut grass, and I realize so much of what I do as a pastor, the progress isn't obvious. It takes a while, right? We're all in progress, and so I don't ever feel like I get to the finish part, right? And so it's nice to be able to finish cutting grass and turn around and see it's completely finished. I love having a 15-year-old son because now I get him to help me. It's wonderful, right? And he likes to cut grass too. He loves to jump on the ride and lawnmower and go and never complains about it, except if it doesn't look like it needs cutting. Because you know, Dad, you got to cut it every week anyway. you just got to cut it. You know, it's got to look manicured all the time. And there are those moments where you're cutting. You can hardly even tell where you've been. It's frustrating, right? You just kind of got to trust yourself. You've kind of done it enough to know what you're doing. And Michael look at me and be like, what's the point? Why are we doing this? Like, I can't even tell where I've been. I'm like, just, just, keep, mar- sh- just keep your mouth shut and keep riding. You know, it's basically what I'm saying. And, and so here are the Israelites. Can you imagine? They're walking around the wall and nothing's happening. Joshua didn't say one time a day for six days, seven times on the last day, 13 times, and they're all going to fall. He didn't say that. He said, just keep marching. Just keep marching. Just keep listening to what I'm telling you to. Trust me and keep marching. And isn't that the way it is following Jesus? So oftentimes we don't know how this is going to turn out. Our progress isn't always often. We have his word. He speaks to us through the power of the Holy Spirit. He gives us the next step. And we just keep marching and we trust him. We keep marching and we trust him and we believe that sooner or later that progress is going to pay off. But it would have been cool, right, that if every time the Israelites made a lap around the city of Jericho, that it, it would have been like Tetris and like the walls would have fell a little bit. Wouldn't that have been good, you know? Like they just, every time we walk, man, they drop two more feet. We see the progress and we can see what's happening. We can see where it is that we're going. But that didn't happen for them. And it's probably not happening for you. And so for some of us in the room, we get so frustrated and we get tired because what we're doing doesn't seem like it's working. Here's the third thing. The progress isn't always obvious, but the process is open-ended. Like we want the end. We, We always do this. Well, when we get through this season, things will slow down a bit. No, they won't. 
And if we just get through this, there's, there's never an end. It, there's going to be an end when you stop breathing, right? And so, like, the process is, is open-ended. And, and, and so, so they had to keep marching, even though they didn't know when the result was actually going to happen. They didn't know when God was going to do the miraculous. And so here's the question. Will you pray even when the answer hasn't come for six days? Will you serve when nobody seems to appreciate what you're doing? Will you still show up even when it doesn't feel like you're even making a difference? Will you keep giving and being generous when you're struggling to see provision flow back your way? The question is, will you still? Will you still march when you're not sure when the walls are going to ever come down? Because I'm convinced that God is working when what you're doing doesn't seem to be. Let me say that again because you missed it, all right? God is working when what you're doing doesn't seem to be. I know what you're doing sometimes doesn't seem like it's working, but God is still moving. And God is still at work in your life. And so don't you dare do what I feel like I've been tempted to do so many times. Start marching. Stop marching on day six. Day one and two is pretty easy, right? It's, it's easy when it's just starting. Man, day three and day four, man, you start asking, man, is this working? Is God even, does God even know we're out here doing this? It's, it's hot. It's August in North Carolina. It is hot out here. Why are we doing this? We are wasting time. I don't, I don't even like Pastor Anthony anymore. This is dumb. Like, why are we continuing to, to do this? And somewhere around day six, it's like, I'm about to peace out on this. And then on day seven, it gets really hard because you don't have to walk just once. Now you got to walk seven times. And I've often thought when I've wanted to quit, how bad would it be if we quit on the 12th lap? How bad would it be if we've invested this time and we've invested prayer and faith and all of these things and then all of a sudden because we get tired and frustrated that we quit somewhere around lap 12. One lap short of the greatest miracle that you could ever see in your life. Maybe, maybe you're here this morning and you feel like you're losing your grip. Maybe you've even like checked out. Maybe you're here physically, in a physical sense. Mentally, emotionally, spiritually, you're just checking out. Don't stop short of God's miracle in your life. Because here's verse 20. When the people heard the sound of the ram's horn, just like Joshua said, they shouted as loud as they possibly could. And then suddenly the walls of Jericho collapsed and the Israelites charged straight into the town and captured it. Now here's what I want you to see. Joshua didn't knock down the walls and neither did the Israelites. God did every bit of it. All they had to do was be obedient, trust Him, and take Him at His word. So what do you do when you're in the gap? Man, just be obedient. Just trust Him. And take him at his word. And when the reality doesn't match up with the expectation, you worship him anyway. Because you trust that he knows better than you. When the result doesn't match your expectation you keep worshiping and you keep praising him because he knows better than you and he knows better than us he hasn't been on this journey for us for two years we've, we've prayed for my brother's healing we prayed for God to work a miracle in his life expectation was that God would heal him from cancer. 
And then two years of battling and watching my brother struggle and fight. Like, God, do you hear this? Do you, do you see this? Do you, do you know what's happening here? Do you not, you're not paying attention when we pray. Like, what's happening? Like, and so you struggle for faith, right? You struggle to believe. You, you struggle to hold on. You struggle to, to keep your grip. It's not looking like you're praying. later he goes home to be with Jesus the reality never matched the expectation and people keep asking me how are you doing are you okay like, how's your family doing I can honestly tell you we're fine I miss my brother like Christmas is never going to be the same I see things that make me think of him every single day and it breaks my heart because I miss my brother. But just because God's reality didn't match, my reality didn't shake my faith because I trust that he's rejoicing around the throne of God today. And so even though God didn't heal him the way I wanted him to be healed, he still healed. And just because my reality doesn't match my expectation doesn't mean God's not working and that God's not moving. I can't find my car keys most of the time. And yet, I'm going to tell God the way He's supposed to run the universe? His ways are not my ways. His thoughts are not my thoughts. All of those things are higher than and so while I pray specifically, because he said, you have not, because you ask not, ask anything in my name, believing in that, I will give it to you. Yes, I have an expectation, and I'm very specific when I pray, because God honors bold prayer, and bold prayer honors God. But always when I pray, I, and it's not a lack of faith, I always pray, but God, what I ultimately want is for your perfect plan and life and if what I'm praying for is not your will then I submit my will to your authority in my life I surrender to you and you can say that's a cop out that's a lack of faith if you want I believe with all my heart that is surrendering my heart and my life to my Savior I want what he wants and then asking him to give us courage and strength to be able to trust him reality doesn't look like what you thought it would. Here's what I've learned. He's good. He's good. And He loves you. And He can be trusted. Even when what you see doesn't look like you thought it would. Even when your reality is not what you thought it would. It doesn't mean He doesn't love you. It doesn't mean He's not good. And it doesn't mean you can't trust Him. So in that gap, trust, believe, hold on to his word, and you know that he is with you every step of the way. Can I tell you that what's happening in this room right now is so important? It's so important. Your church family, it's important. Being a part of a life group. having somebody to walk the journey with you is important. And they're not huge things. Like they're, they're small things. But so, sometimes the small things we ignore cause the biggest problems when, when they're not there, you know? I was reading this past week and this Air Force Lieutenant General said that there was a bird at a launch site, not a real bird, but a talk of the talk now. Plane um, that was destroyed, and the launch site was destroyed, and, and, and it was a twenty-two million dollar loss. Twenty-two million dollars, and all of that was lost because of a fuel valve that failed, and that part cost them twenty-five dollars. That one small twenty-five dollar fuel valve 
caused a $22 million catastrophe. And when we ignore some of the fundamental things that God's put in our life, when we ignore those things, oftentimes the result is catastrophic. So plug in. This is a great church family. I, this, this past week, I, I don't always post on Facebook or uh, social media, but I often stalk you and uh, get really good sermon material that way. Uh, know how to pray for people. <laughs> Y'all should stop posting so much. <laughs> this week I was encouraged. There were pictures of, of forged. Your post blessed me this week. Man, those pictures from that small group, man, it was just, I, that was amazing to watch how you're living life together. And, and it was beautiful. Had some of you send me texts of things that you were doing, prayer walks that you were taking, man, and, and that might not have been a whole lot for you guys to post that or send that. It gave me life, and it was just like, wow, this is such a great place. These are wonderful people. We are so, so, so blessed. I talk to a lot of pastors who aren't blessed like this. Man, I, I, I had a pastor friend that texted me late last night and said, I want you, I want you to pray. He said, I'm even scared to go to church tomorrow. That's a very different experience. Not everybody has 